All right. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture, which is going to be the center of gravity for the next nine months. So if you are willing and able, would you stand for a reading from God's Word? This is John 13. Jesus said these words, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So over the next nine months, that phrase from Jesus, love one another, is going to be home base. Not every series will, will directly tie to those words, but we'll, we'll keep coming back to them over and over and over again. So as far as the big picture for the year, I want to start with the end in mind. In the spring, we're going to focus on what it means to love our neighbor and, and how you speak to people that might not know Jesus, or maybe speak to people that have walked away from faith or walked away from church. In the middle of the year, we're going to talk about how we love each other. We'll, we'll talk about all those great one another passages in the Bible. We're going to talk about relationships. We're going to talk about marriage. How, how do you do that well as Christ followers? But to start off this fall, for the next few weeks, this is really the angle we're taking on we'll love one another. So say these three words with me. Love your enemies. Now, does anybody have any guess as to why we might be starting with love your enemies? It's going to be an interesting fall. So, a few months ago, I attended the Pepperdine lectureships, and I went to lots of classes, took lots of notes. But there were two sentences from all the lectures I attended that really stuck out to me. The first one was from a keynote from Mike Cope, and he was quoting his late friend Landon Saunders, who was very influential in Churches of Christ, speaker, author, passed away earlier this year. And in the final weeks of his life, Mike Cope had a really interesting conversation with Landon Saunders in which Landon Saunders said these words, I am not looking forward to dying, but I am looking forward to not being around for the 2024 election. <laughs> And when I heard that, I thought, yes, that, what a great sentiment. Like, this captures so much of what so many people have said to me over the last few months. They, like, there's a big part of me that resonates uh, with this line. I, I'm not looking forward to this fall. I've had so many conversations, and, and I'm talking over the course of the year, not just in the last few weeks and months with all the dramatic things like the assassination attempt and Biden dropping out and then all the drama with with VPs, but I'm talking all throughout the year. I've had conversations that go something like this. Someone will say, well, are you looking forward to the the fall? No, not at all. (laughs) Why is that? Well, if you remember four years ago, our country became so emotionally invested in this one election that we tore each other apart. Oh yeah, I remember now. Do you think that's going to go any different this time? Nope. I've had so many conversations like that. And to be honest, a big part of me feels that way. Like part of me, I just want to fast forward. Everybody's going to get mad. Half the country after the election is going to get depressed for two weeks. But then we're going to get to Christmas and surely it's going to be okay. Or depending on how the voting goes, maybe it'll be Valentine's Day. But at some point... We're going to wake up, okay, we we can move on. And so part of me, like, oh, I just want to move on. It's going to be terrible. Well, there was a second quote that I heard at this lectureship that I really liked. Kind of changed my thinking. So someone was teaching, and he quoted, of all people, Philip Yancey. Philip Yancey, who stood on this stage just a few months ago, said this. He said, if the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church then the current political scene hardly serves as a threat. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> this, this totally different part of my heart was awakened, the part that recognizes the lordship of Jesus over all the world. It's the part of me that knows Colossians 1. Jesus is the supreme image of God. He's, he's over all authorities and powers and rulers and principalities, invisible and visible. He's, he's Lord of everything. 
and I was reminded that, that nothing in the history of the world has stopped Jesus Christ. Rome couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't silence him. Satan couldn't hold him. Nothing has stopped Jesus Christ. And so this particular election cycle is not going to threaten the reign of Jesus. Everything is going to be fine. And it's not because you're going to try really hard. And it's not because I'm going to try really hard. Things are going to be fine because Jesus is alive. It's okay. Now the country is going to be racked with hate. But you don't have to be. Because you have a choice. And so here's a totally different frame of mind to go into this fall. This is the greatest opportunity for the church to shine. Because the world's going to get really, really dark. So years ago when my daughters were really young, maybe four and six years old, they would listen to me preach. And sometimes when I preached, I would say things like, being a Christian's hard. We have to be countercultural. And then at home, they would say, Dad, what are you talking about? <laughs> being a Christian is not hard. This is great. We go to preschool. We go to journeyland. This is, this is wonderful. How could be, being a Christian be difficult? Well, from their vantage point growing up in, in this church, of course it wasn't hard. It was amazing. It was easy. Well, now they would tell you different. And do you know why? <laughs> Two words. Middle school. <laughs> now, against the backdrop of kids with different worldviews and kids who talk differently and kids from broken families and observing fights in the lunchroom and the language and the crude humor, like they understand that if you really shine your light for Jesus, it's going to be hard. In other words, the darker the night gets, the brighter the light shines. I'm a big, big church camp fan, and I've been going to Petty John for a really, really long time. Many of you grew up going to Petty John. You've been to Petty John. One of the things I love about going to Camp Petty John is that the end of every night, all the teenagers get together at this big circle, and we sing songs, and we look up, and you can see the stars, and you can see them really, really well. In fact, you can see them a lot better in the middle of Medill, Oklahoma, than you can in Edmond or Oklahoma City. And the reason you can look up at the night sky and see these tens of thousands of bright dots is because the night sky is so dark down there. When the night gets darker, the light shines brighter. That's why I'm actually looking forward to this fall. It's because it's the greatest opportunity for the church to shine. In fact, Paul agreed. He, he had the same sentiment. He, he believed that the church could shine when the backdrop was really, really dark. In fact, the first series that we're going to launch into within the overall umbrella of love one another is entitled, Like Stars in the Sky. And the whole metaphor the next few weeks comes from Philippians chapter 2, where Paul talks about this very idea that it's possible for, for men and women who believe in Jesus Christ to shine even against a world that's very, very dark. In fact, here's the, here's the text. Here's how it reads in Philippians chapter 2. <laughs> Such a powerful text. <laughs> These words are so hard. I'm laughing because it's I had a hypocritical moment yesterday that I can maybe tell you about later. Okay, verse 14, here we go. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Wow, that's hard. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. So read these words in yellow with me. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. That's the goal, is that we shine. So it's interesting that this comes from Philippians 2, and one thing that Philippians is known for is being a letter of joy, which it is, but it's also written to a local congregation in conflict. So we read in chapter 4 about these two ladies, Judea and Syntyche. Paul writes these words, I plead with Judea, and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. So apparently they're not on the same page. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. There's so much we don't know. It's all we get is a few sentences. But clearly there's something going on in this church that's causing pretty significant 
harm, pretty significant strike. For, for Paul to, to call people out means it had to be significant. So one of the challenges of interpreting the Bible is that we have very little emotional stake in their issues. So for example, if I say, let's talk about head coverings. Most of you would think, oh, okay, sure. But if I said, let's talk about immigration, you would lean forward. Your heart, mate right, your heart rate might increase because that's an issue that has high emotional value for us today, whereas head coverings don't. So when we think about whatever's going on in the Philippian church, it might not be that you have an emotional uh, uh, reaction to it, but they did. These were real people worshiping together, real lives with dreams and hopes and fears and relationships and personalities, and something had gone wrong in this church. And that's why I'm so thankful. I, I like The Chosen, the TV show, for so many reasons, but one of the reasons I like it so much is they, they help us see the tension back then so we can relate to it. So here's, we, we have no idea what these ladies are fighting about. But here's a hypothetical situation that if it were true would add weight to what Paul says here. So the, the, Philippi was a Roman military outpost. And historians tell us that about 50% of the people that lived there were current or former Roman military. So let's just say, for example, that Syntyche is a widow and she comes to faith in Jesus, starts worshiping at this church, and Yudia comes in a few years later with her husband, and Syntyche then finds out that Yudia's husband was the very Roman soldier that killed her own son about 10 years ago. And Syntyche knows about Jesus, and she knows about forgiveness, and she knows that she's supposed to, to look in this man's eyes and say, I love you just like Jesus loves you, but she finds it hard. And, and now she, it's really hard for her to show up and worship Jesus when she's looking into the eyes of this man that took her son's life. And so maybe Syntyche recruits just three or four other people and says, hey, I don't want to disrupt the church, but would you just on Sundays just come meet with me in my house and let's have our own little group. But then let's say the rest of the church finds out about it, and they say, you can't do that. That's going to divide the church. Well, again, this is a hypothetical, but if this were true, this would be serious conflict. And so the only reason I give you that hypothetical is just to say, whatever's going on here is huge for Paul to call these women to attention and ask the church to help them. This is a big problem. And so what does Paul say to a church that's in the middle of real tension, real conflict? Well, in the heart of the letter, we just read it, chapter 2. He says, do everything without complaining and without arguing. And if you do that, you're going to shine. You're going to shine like stars in the sky. It is amazing that Paul says it's this little point about not arguing that leads to the shining. Because if, if you know the letter of Philippians, if you read through it, it actually seems pretty weird that he says it at this point because the most famous passage in the whole letter is also in chapter 2. It's, it's, it's known as the Christ hymn. We think it, the early church sang it. It's, this, it's, it's arguably the most ex exquisite expression of Christology in the Bible. So it's very familiar to, to many Christians. Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. That's how it starts. And it ends with Jesus being exalted to the right hand of God in every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth, bowing before the name of King Jesus. It's this incredible piece of Christology. So it would make a lot of sense if Paul had said right after that, if you can just understand this amazing gift that God gave you in, in his son Jesus, if you can just comprehend it, then you'll shine like stars in the universe. That would make sense. Or it would also make sense if Paul had said, if you can just explain this to your neighbor, if you can just walk up to your neighbor and explain to them how God came in human form and died for the sins of the world and got raised from the dead, if you just can learn how to explain that to your neighbor, then you will shine like stars in the sky. But that's not what he says. 
Paul says, I mean, just let the gravity sink in here. The most brilliant mind of his generation, writing arguably one of the most brilliant passages of his whole writing career, and a man who wants every man, woman, and child to be saved, says that the way you shine is when you don't complain and when you don't argue. That's what causes the shining. So everybody goes in the, like we all have conflict. You have tension right now. I have tension right now. But the ones that shine, it, it's the people that shine are not those that avoid conflict. We, we all have to deal with it. The people that shine are not those that foster it and egg it on. The ones that really shine are those that engage conflict like Christ did. It's the people that decide in their minds that loving is more important than winning. It's the people that decide, you know what, how I treat you is more important than whether or not I win this argument. It's the people that shine are those that actually see human beings, not just opinions and positions. Like these are the people that shine. In other words, here, so here's, here's the first lesson out of the gate in this first series, Shine Like Stars, Love One Another. First lesson, which I really hope this, just carry this one with you over the next few weeks and months. Your character is actually going to outshine your intelligence. Like that, that's what Paul's getting at. You, you shine because you're not arguing. You shine because you're not complaining. These are character issues. They have to deal with, with how you treat other people. Now, the reality, this is really hard for me, and this is hard for a lot of us because many of us really care about knowledge and wisdom and understanding. I'm a preacher. I love this stuff. And we're a really educated church. Like, there's so many smart people in this room. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in the Bible class and listened to some of your comments and, and th thought in my head, wow, that was amazing. I should preach a sermon on that. <laughs> like, you're, you're brilliant. Like, the things that you read, what you listen to, the way you're able to synthesize deep thoughts of theology and philosophy and articulate them so well. I mean, I'm not, it, it's truly amazing how intelligent of a church that we are. But the reality is four years from now, no one's going to care how smart you were. No one's going to care if you destroyed so-and-so in some argument. No one's going to care that you, you posted some great counter-argument on social media to someone that had posted something else. Like, nobody is going to stand up on the day of your funeral and read off some really amazing email that you sent trying to argue some point. That's not what you will be remembered for. But the reality is so many of us care about those things. Like, we spend so much of our time trying to win and win and win and win at all costs. It's, it's almost like, for, and again, I'm not saying this is you, but for some of us, we care more about being right than being righteous in the best sense of the word. We so badly want to win. We so badly want to be right that we do it at the expense of other people. And Paul's saying, that's not what causes us to shine. What causes us to shine is our, our character. It's how you treat people. And then conversely, what causes us to fade is our lack of character. So when you treat people with contempt and when you're judgmental towards others and when you're rude and when you belittle others, the, the, the light gets darker and darker and darker and darker. Your character is going to outshine your intelligence. So you ever wonder where all the partisan hatred started. A lot of historians think it goes all the way back to Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. So these guys grew up best friends, or really good friends early on in their political for careers. They both thought it was a good idea to leave Britain. They both helped write the Declaration of Independence, and they both early on wrote about how much they thought that political parties would be a terrible idea. They thought it would destroy the country. So these guys were tight. Well, fast forward to 1796. They both run for president. And it gets really heated. They say some awful, 
awful things to each other as they are running for presidency. The two parties back then are the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, and it gets nasty. So Adams wins the election, and Jefferson actually feels bad for some of the things that he said. And so he actually writes a letter to Adams trying to reconcile all that has just happened, trying to put this relationship back together. He apologizes in the letter, but then get this, this strange little piece of American history. He never sent the letter. You know why? (laughs) Another political figure, James Madison said, don't send the letter because people in our political party are going to think that it's too conciliatory and they're going to think that you're weak. And so Jefferson never sent the letter. So four years later, another election, the two guys run against each other again, and this time it's even worse. The political hatred and animosity and and just the the, the language used towards each other is crazy. In fact, years ago, I've I've read some statements they said to each other. It's, It's nasty stuff. Jefferson wins the election this time. On inauguration day, this is the day that Adams can actually stand up and graciously give the reins to his successor, and really promote what what he has helped develop, this this modern democracy. But Adams is so angry that he lost, that he leaves the White House at 4 a.m. on a stagecoach because he can't stand giving over the presidency to Thomas Jefferson. So he leaves. Now, I just like to think, what would have happened if that could have gone differently? Like, Like, think about the ripple effect to this hatred. If Jefferson had actually sent the letter to Adams, that could have changed the the course of our country. Or if Adams had just stayed and graciously accepted defeat, again, that that could have changed the trajectory of our country. I, I I have no idea if they realize this, but what those two men did and how they treated each other during those days is that they started 225 years of partisan hatred, and we're still living in the mess. Now notice their imprint on history, at least in this story, had little to do with their intellect. It had everything to do with their character or their lack of character. They were geniuses in their own right, but they didn't, they didn't know how to treat each other. And so here's, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have a test over the next few weeks or months. And it's going to come in the form of, it could be several things. It, it might be online somebody you know is going to post something and you're going to read it and you're going to think, what? How could they, how could they say that? And you're going to get really mad. Could be that you're, you're in Bible class and someone makes a comment and you think, how, I cannot believe she just said that. And your, your, your skin's going to crawl and you're not going to know what to do. It, It could be that you're at a family dinner and someone says something directly to push your buttons. It could be that I say something you're like, ah, Phil, why did you say that? It could be that someone sends you an email completely misjudging your thought or your motive. So you're going to have a test. And the test is going to be how are you going to respond when someone's really frustrated at you or when someone just says something really dumb. And when that test comes, please remember this. Jesus never said, blessed are the point makers. Jesus said, say it with me, blessed are the the peacemakers. So your intellect matters and the issues do matter. But your intellect is not what makes you shine. It's your character that makes you shine. So fast forward to 1812, mutual friend Benjamin Rush reaches out to Adams and says, it's just sad that you let that friendship die. I wonder if you could ever get it back. So Adams, after over a decade of not saying one word to Thomas Jefferson, writes a letter. And in the middle of the letter, it says, I don't think we should die before we explain ourselves to one another. Jefferson writes back. In fact, they exchange just a handful of letters. And what's so interesting when you go back and read these letters, they they totally disagree. They never resolve their tension on all these, all sorts of political issues. But what did happen 
is the relationship was restored. And the reason the relationship was restored is because the character came back. The civility came back. The compassion came back. And get this. Some of you history buffs know this. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died on the same day. You know what day it was? July 4th, 1826 the 50th anniversary of the birth of this nation, these two friends who became sworn enemies who then repaired their relationship passed away on the same day. Now, if they can do that as far as putting their relationship back together, then guess what? I I think we could do. We could do that too. We can shine. And so here's what we're going to do to end. In just a minute, we're going to sing. As always, if you have a prayer deed, you'd like a shepherd to pray with you, our shepherds are going to be in the two back atriums. If you want to be baptized, just like we had a baptism last week, you're welcome to come forward uh, down front and we will witness your baptism today. Before we sing that song, I want to do one more little exercise here. So I'm going to turn my flashlight on. Now, if I shine it right at you, you can see it, but for most of you, it's not that bright. But if you go ahead and turn the lights off in the room. As things get darker and darker and... I didn't turn it on. (laughs) So there I told you. I said it earlier. Your preacher's going to say something really dumb at some point. (laughs) I didn't know it was going to be 60 seconds later. (laughs) You can see it pretty well now. But the reality is you can't really see the rest of the room. This is what happens when one person shows character. Yeah, they can make a little bit of a difference. But now if I could ask everybody with a cell phone to pull it out, turn your light on. You see, when one person shines their light, it makes a little bit of a difference. But brothers and sisters, when the church shows character, then we become, in the words of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. I'm not dreading the next few months because of you. Like, you give me hope. We are the church of Jesus Christ, and when we shine our lights, I really do believe we can make a massive difference in this community for our world, for the name of Jesus Christ. The song we sang earlier is not a kid's song. It's a song we all need. So everybody stand up. We're going to sing it one more time. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine.